Welcome everybody to this uh, weekly hangout about Bitcoin, finance, liberty and so much more. Today's guest is influential thinker, pirate and author Rick Falkvinge. My co-host today should be Yancilla Tilia, but she hasn't joined the show yet, but she's trying to, so hopefully she will uh, join soon. She's a former Dutch model and privacy advocate who recently fled to Berlin, uh, Germany. Our focus today will be on civil liberties, freedom of speech, and how Bitcoin can replace or at least improve the nation state and their ledgers. Viewers can ask questions, of course, using the Q&A tool. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel and follow us on Google+, Plus so you will never miss a single episode. Rick, welcome. Thank you, Paul. It's great to be here. I mean, we we um, we spoke a little bit in uh, in Netherlands last time, and I mean, Bitcoin is taking a lot of flack right now. The legends are taking a lot of flack, and I don't think that's fair. I mean, if you're looking at the <laughs> the Internet dot com bust in uh, that started on May thirty first, twenty oh one, we can we can sort of see in hindsight that the internet turned out pretty okay after all. So, uh, I'm totally psyched on, on uh, the subject, on speaking to you and to, to uh, and Celatilia again and everything about this. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, it's, it's a great pleasure and it was um, good to catch up with you in Holland. Unfortunately, you were a bit um, a bit uh, blue after the after your presentation, so you had to go into your hotel um, uh, quickly afterwards. So it's great that we can catch up now and possibly Dutch viewers can uh, ask some of the questions that they um, didn't have time to ask for last time. Uh, Even better. Uh, about um, your involvement with the Pirate uh, Party movement worldwide. Do, are you still involved and what do you currently do for the Pirate Party? I found, so I founded the Swedish Pirate Party on January 1st, 2006. We had the, uh, I sort of uh, looked at the number of file shares in Sweden at that time, which was 1.2 million, and figured that they were actively demonized. So if just one in five, frankly, were pissed off enough at not being represented in legislature, we would have 225,000 votes, and that would be enough to start changing law. Three and a half years later, we did get 225,915 votes, so it was pretty good, pretty good on target there. And what I didn't expect was for this to start spreading, just like you say. I mean, it's now spread to 70 countries with various varying degrees of success, various degrees of nascency, various degrees of maturity, obviously. I mean, when you have a movement this young, you can't expect everybody to have solid structure from, from the get-go. So what I'm doing now in this movement is essentially being the founder. I mean, I stepped down from uh, uh, the position as, as party leader in, in the Swedish Pirate Party on uh, January 1st, 2011, f to the date five years after I founded it. I don't think you should be doing the same thing more than five years. So these days I, I'm traveling and speaking about the ideas of free, freedom of speech, civil liberties, and generally, the what I call analog equivalent rights, how the civil liberties we had in the analog world must carry over to our children's environment in the digital world. And unfortunately, politicians are absolutely clueless as to that topic. Right. And do you see yourself ever returning to the political stage? Well, what is political? I mean, I'm arguing for a better society. I keep building public opinion. I keep arguing the points of civil civil liberties. I, I think that's rather political. And even though it, I may not be running for office at the time being, but I'm certainly doing political work. Exactly. Yeah, and um, I've, I've been listening a lot to your um, show, um, Liberty Report. Uh, thank mm. you for this. Episode. It's really cool because they're relatively short. So they're like bite size. Whenever I have a free moment, I can watch an episode. But you come across um, as, as, as almost libertarian. Um, do, do you agree with that? Or? Uh, yeah, I, th I think we are all, I think the community in general is heading in that direction. I mean, with Bitcoin, with the internet, with decentralization, as it happens on every front, Paul, I think we are starting to realize that the nation state has frankly <laughs> overstated its own importance as we uh, as we grew up through our formative years and we're gradually starting to see the illusion of the necessity of everything the nation state aspires to be i think we can do a lot of those things better ourselves frankly and bitcoin just being one of those I mean, you had the postal system, which was and is a behemoth uh, in many countries. Along came email and just basically kicked it out overnight. You have Bitcoin looking to do the same with financial services. You had uh, 
lots and lots of services on uh, on the net, which is frankly obsoleting the concept of public service, where you had a governmentally quality assured news channel. And I mean, yeah. this is just being obsoleted. Yeah, and um, so basically, we a lot of things we can do ourselves um, by using new techn technologies and by decentralizing things using our own ledgers. Um, but then there will still be um, there's still a lot of people within the pirate party, of course, that want to redistribute income, for example, um, through through basic income. Is that something you support too? Basic income is a very interesting idea. It obviously does require force in uh, order to collect taxes. So you can't be an anarchist and support basic income redistribution by force. You can support a voluntary basic income like BitNation is, is uh, trying to achieve now. I, I'm very much following that, uh, following that experiment with a lot of interest. But yes, I mean, when you're talking about a, a unconditional basic income, a lot of people think, in, think of it in terms of mooching off, slack, slacking off, just basically lying on the couch all day doing nothing. I have a slightly different perspective on an unconditional basic income. I see it as a basic guarantee, uh, basic guaranteed income, which essentially promotes innovation in a society. It promotes risk taking, and we know from building the internet, from building technologies, that any society that promotes entrepreneurship will have a head start. So that's how I regard unconditional basic income. I see it as a way to get a, a competitive advantage for society purely from from a libertarian standpoint if you like purely from a decentralized standpoint and not at all in the way of um, making sure that people don't have to work that it just doesn't work like that I mean uh, if you're looking at that there are about 10 people 10 percent of people who don't work whether they are employed or not frankly and it, it the these are the poor these are the guys who are going from job to job and who don't work whether whether they are employed or not. These 10% will not work with an unconditional basic income. But we can see that the rest of the population do work over and above what's required, no matter what their formal employment is. And I right. don't think that psyche is going to change. But that 10% but, then will, will receive the unconditional income um, if it were up to you? They would, uh, being unconditional, but I think that would be a good thing, to be honest. If I can be a bit cynical, that would get them off the workforce, so they would not be, they would be able to lie on the couch, which means that they would not be hindering production as they are today. Right. We got a question from uh, Rico Brouwer. He's um, he's a Dutch pirate. Maybe um, you probably know him, but he asked, um, should income, this basic income, start in a country, or does it have to be implemented on a, on a global scale? Because of course you can imagine that if it's if it's in one country, especially in Europe where there's free movement of people, then it will work as an as a as a as a magnet to to to, to people that just want to make use of it, and that will then migrate to Holland. So how would you implement something like that? I'm not sure it would, you know. I mean, it's a very interesting question, as in the competitiveness. But you can also easily observe that this has been tried. It was tried on a small scale in Canada, for instance, in the 1970s, something called Mincom. And it was shut for moral reasons, essentially, as the political administration shifted. But people didn't move in droves to that city just because there was an unconditional basic income there. So the evidence speaks against that gut feeling, at this point at least. Right. So let's talk a bit about, um, about governments more and, and nation states. Um, you write a lot of in your articles about how governments over time have uh, monopolized uh, control over ledgers, how they um, centrally control values, titles, identities, assets, all of that. So um, you also mentioned BitNation briefly already. Can you mm -hmm. explain how, how blockchain technology can seriously disrupt this this, this status quo and how we can uh, um, use other ledgers to fulfill some of these tasks that our government, that governments are oh. doing right now. Oh, I'd absolutely love to talk about that. We had 30 days on this program, right? 30, it was 30, 30 something. Yeah, it's a month, it's a month episode. Yeah, it's the longest episode. Cool, cool. I might make it. So, <laughs> you can observe that power has always been in two things. It has been in the ability to, to tell people what is true and what is false. 
as in having the information advantage, and has, it has been in the power to dictate who owns what, controlling the ledger. The internet has shattered the information advantage, which is why we are seeing essentially a war on the internet. It used to be that if you could control what is true and what is false, you don't have to own anything because you're already a god among men on, on this planet. You can have anything you want because you can you can determine what's true in people's minds. So the ability for everybody to broadcast their own truth has shattered this monopoly that used to be, or an oligopoly following the free, the, um, the the um, printing press. So that's the first step. The second step, which we're seeing now, is the the break uh, the breakup of this monopoly on who owns what. It used to be that the nation state was formed, or the roots of the modern nation state were was formed when you had judges, the crown's judges, go, going out to villages in the medieval ages and settling disputes. I mean, that, that's what the judges were there for initially, right? That there wasn't even any criminal law to begin with. It was seen as a civil dispute. If you killed somebody but from that particular family, it was settled by an exchange of, of property. Yeah, it's a big lot of money, for example. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So criminal law didn't initially exist. It was all about transfer of property. And once the uh, these judges representing the nation state had established that they had the power to move property, they had the power to know, to control who owned what, it also quickly became apparent that the nation state didn't have to ask for taxes anymore the nation state could order taxes to be paid to it and so you have this transition from the feudal state where serfs were working for the local lord of the land to a into a uh, nascent modern uh, nation state government where it commanded taxes to be paid as a direct result of being able to transfer property from people it could all suddenly also transfer property from people to itself so mm -hmm. Hence, the control of the ledger, the control of who owns what. And having the ability to rewrite the ledger is what the modern nation-state government is built on. It has built a lot on top of that afterward, but that's what, where, it roots, where its roots lie. So with Bitcoin and the blockchain, we are seeing the modern government being reduced to a spectator of the ledger rather than an authority over the ledger. And they are no, not going to let that go without a fight. So th this is going to get really ugly. I mean, if you thought the internet was bad when it was just about who owns the newspapers, essentially, wait until you see a fight over who owns the money, who owns the land. Imagine when land registries go on the blockchain. I mean, that that's just... A, it's effectively just a matter of time. Land registry is so screwed up. Go ahead. Yeah, but let's discuss that example. For example, like um, take Holland. Um, let's say I own a property. I need to right now. It has to be re registered with the public um, lands registry. Mm -hmm. How how can we make sure that uh, we move it from that ledger to a new ledger, be it blockchain or Ethereum, whatever? How are we going to? To, um, to take care of that process. That's the thing, right? I mean, you, you cannot fight against the existing system. If you want to replace the existing system, you don't fight it. You build something new that outcompetes it. Just like Bitcoin did, just like the Internet did, and just like we're all doing all the time by decentralizing. We're essentially being non-compliant with central power. So you can observe in Africa, for instance, that land registry does not effectively work. So there you have a brilliant chance of just leapfrogging the um, legacy systems and building something new from, from the get-go. But it's really hard on weekends, right? And so how are we going to do it in more... Right. In more uh, let's take the United States as, a, uh, as an example instead. If, you, if you're looking at the United States, land registry is a mess. It's usually owned in several several levels with the mortgage, mortgaging bank and then to a mortgage institute and onward in several levels and frankly papers have been lost and mixed up to the point where you're seeing and we've seen we've seen these horror stories where the bank just repossesses the entirely wrong house where somebody has no idea of who owns a plot of land because the it, it's so messed up and 
out of such a mess, you would be able to build something new just at competing the old, frankly. And where that, where that such an initiative comes from, well, I, you wouldn't see it until it had happened. Yeah, or maybe like a small nation state, an island, or one. You have so many exactly, different islands. Exactly, exactly, exactly. They can't just you'd say, oh, from now on, we're just going to timestamp everything on a blockchain. And um, Exactly. You'd, you'd probably have easier time succeeding in a small nation like Iceland or even one of the microstates in, uh, in Micronesia just by demonstrating this as a proof of concept and then sort of percolate up and scale from there. Yeah. And that's... Of course, there's a lot of um, other goods that you don't have to formally register with the government, which you can register in any type of, uh, of blockchain. So uh, we can, of course, start, and Bitcoin is, the, is an example of that, of course. So we can first de um, try to work th with as many of those goods as possible, and maybe later on, when people are getting used to it, we can then make a step towards uh, making some of these government ledgers up, uh, obsolete as well. Absolutely. Um, but, however, this is not... This is not at all without its share of problems. I mean, if you have land where private where a private key signifies your ownership of that land and you lose that private key does nobody own the land anymore there, there, there are problems like that that need to be solved this is not clear cut at the moment it's just a it's just yeah. a sea of brilliant possibilities I mean if you have a Bitcoin and lose the key to that Bitcoin there are suddenly one there's suddenly one less Bitcoin in circulation and that is not a problem because it means uh, that all the other Bitcoin increase a little right. in value but a plot of land that is unowned, you have a correlation to a physical scarce, scarcity that just cannot be unmapped in the same way. And, and that's still a problem to be solved. But yeah, it can be solved. It's about we, uh, who owns the guns, of course, in the case like that. The, the, and right now the government has monopoly on force. So exactly. they, can, they can just um, uh, confiscate it. Another another thing is you, you've changed your name, right? Rick Rick Falkman is not your real name. Um, I, I read it, it is my it is my real legal name, but I did change right. it. I I was yeah. born with a different real legal name. Yeah, but it would be amazing if you could just change your identity whenever you wanted using using a, a non-governmental blockchain, right? That would be actually. I think we're heading there. I mean, if you're looking at the uh, people growing up on the net, they are used to changing their names and identities and personas as often if they change underwear, or if not more often. So this yeah. idea that, that a government has a right to allow or not permit people what, what people should call themselves, I don't think the internet generation is going to stand for that. Right. So that is going to happen in one way or another, I'm sure. Yeah. And so recently the price of is, is Bitcoin has been going down a lot. Have you lost any sleep on it or not? Well, it's not funny looking at the charts, but then again, <laughs> you know, every time I've acted on the charts, I've always bought high and sold low. So I, I'm kind of clenching my teeth and trying to learn from experience here. I've lost, man, I've lost so much trying to catch the swings. So yeah. I know that if I'm acting on it, learning from experience, I'm just going to lose more than if I just sit it out, you know? Yeah, because I, you were on record uh, saying um, during a London Real episode a year ago that the price would eventually reach two to five billion dollars. Do you stand by this forecast? Absolutely. I mean, uh, there, there's. Oh, I've run the numbers. There's nothing changed in those numbers. If you're just because the price is falling now, that that doesn't mean that the technology as such has lost any. Um, any potential applications. It just means that if somebody is selling a, a ton of Bitcoin, which is fine, it's an open market. But if you're looking at where what Bitcoin is going to outcompete, kind of like how email outcompeted the postal service letters, then the market value of that uh, divided by the number of available Bitcoin uh, means that we're going to end up with a per Bitcoin value on somewhere in the two, 2 to 5 million range. That's not going to be next year, obviously. It's not going to be the year after that. If you're looking at a new technology, it typically takes 10 years from inception until it hits the mainstream. And it takes another 10 years from hitting mainstream until it's a mature technology. So if you're taking YouTube as an example, or say streaming video, you saw that on porn sites, <laughs> uh, Porn, porn's always first with the porn sites 1994, 1995-ish, streaming, streaming GIF images. Very interesting concept, very novel technology, not really very useful. 
how and YouTube hit in 2004, 2005. I'm not sure which year it was, but it wasn't that range. Ten years after streaming video has started online. But it wasn't today's size when it launched. Today, YouTube is huge. I mean, it, it is one of the... It is essentially the television. All right. And what, about, what about the other, what about the other uh, protocols then? Because uh, Bitcoin blockchain is, of course, uh, it's a brilliant technology, but it has been copied and improved by certain other um, competing chains um, with their own native currencies. So, uh, wh how are you so sure that Bitcoin is the, the 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 blockchain that will dominate over time? Oh, you, you, you're not. You're absolutely not sure about that. I mean, there is the network effect, but the network effect can be overcome. If you're, um, I mean, I'm essentially predicting here that it takes 10 years until it hits mainstream and then another 10 years until everybody's using it. So we're looking at a 20-year time frame. We're looking at tw a Bitcoin mainstream going 2019, 2020, and then another 10 years after that until it is the thing. It just needs to hit, it's going to hit mainstream usability sometime 2019, 2020. But obviously, you're not sure it's going to be Bitcoin. I, I think it's going to be a blockchain technology, but not the bit, doesn't have to be the Bitcoin blockchain. There, what speaks for that is that there's so much money invested in mining and other, and other Bitcoin specific hardware that it's going to take a ton of money to supersede that. But, but, if you're looking at Facebook, Facebook's dominance now, that was by no means a given, and it's been replaced with network effect and everything a number of times. Before Facebook, you had, you had MySpace. Before MySpace, you had Friendster. Before Friendster, you had Six Degrees. So yeah. they've all been replaced, and there's nothing saying Facebook is the end game either. Right. Okay. Let's change, let's change gears here because we um, we also um, want to talk a little bit about um, civil liberties and, and, and freedom of speech. Um, mm -hmm. Just to to start um, with an interesting question from Rico Brouwer again. Um, Rick, do you think the Paris attack makes European leaders join in uh, on opposing liberties, much like they might oppose a common threat like um, Bitcoin, or maybe uh, phrased differently, do you think it was a false flag attack? Or? I don't think it was a false flag attack. I think it was a couple of deranged people who thought they were acting for some some religious entity and basically didn't understand the equivalent of the first commandment, you, you shall not kill. Actually, that's not the first commandment, but you get the picture. As in, what part did you not understand about Islam being a re religion of peace and Christianity being a religion of love? But... There's always this radicalization. I mean, if you close yourself into a small enough bubble, you can get any crazy ideas and then start acting on them. So I don't think it was a false flag attack. I am concerned about the total, utter, and absolute hypocrisy by European leaders who, who are marching in Paris, claiming to, to march for freedom of speech and freedom of the press and then go home to jail journalists to introduce censorship. So, uh, Dave, uh, David Cameron went home and said that I don't think there's that people should be allowed to communicate in a way we can't listen to. I mean the guy obviously had no idea what he was saying. He was essentially talking about outlawing face-to-face -face vocal cord communication because the government could, wouldn't be able to listen to it. Exactly. Yeah, but, maybe in the future we're not allowed to whisper anymore. Exactly, right? So, I'm not afraid so much for, for the te technology. I am afraid that it, with the political leaders, there seems to be a cognitive disconnect that they actually think they are acting for freedom of speech, and then they are doing the complete opposite. And they know, I, I don't think they're even aware of it. And the, this goes back to what I was talking about, analog equivalent rights earlier, that you have the right to send a sealed letter in an envelope and not have it o not have it opened in transit to the recipient. That right was something our parents took for granted. That right has not carried over to our children in the digital environment. And I think that's one of the greatest and most dangerous failures of our generation, to be honest. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I always like to quote Voltaire in, in this case. He disagreed with everything someone said as long as, but he would keep, um, his, he would defend it to the death, the right to say it. And exactly, exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I, I had this uh, 
rant about freedom of speech that there's since the Charlie Hebdo attacks there have been so many people stating everywhere that every statement must be legal as long as it is legal essentially yeah. worded in many different ways but that's been the, the, the essence of it and if you're saying that you don't understand what freedom of speech is freedom of speech means that there is no test for whether what you say is legal or not it means that if you are uttering an opinion that is legal no yeah. matter what you are saying as the Pope, the, Pope, the Pope said, there are limits to freedom of expression when religion is insulted. So that's what the Pope said in this case. So it's, it's, the, I know, same, right? it's the same category. But, but I know, right? It's the exact same thing. The, the, obviously, religion and other superstitions must, must be allowed to criticize. And satire is a very efficient form of, of, of criticism. It's, uh, humor has always been one of the best avenues for, for criticism uh, through... Uh, through the medieval ages, actually. I mean, if you look at the the court jester with, with royalty, they were always the only ones not subject to censorship, and they were the only ones allowed to heckle the royalty and nobility because they were not dangerous, because they they posed no threat. So they were the only ones not subject to censorship. Right. And the Holland, so we had a case in where a cartoonist um, is, is um, I'm sorry, Paul, I lost you there for a minute. Could you repeat from the Dutch politicians are shouting preserve the freedom of speech while their acts in 2008, where a certain cartoonist was arrested by a squad team because of his cartoons. At the same time, now Dutch politicians are are, are trying to defend the freedom of speech, which of course is also very uh, hypocritical. Yep, and and I think my my I think my greatest worry is that people are def claiming to defend freedom of speech without understanding what it is. I mean, this simple test, this simple criteria that if you're making a if you're uttering a political opinion, that should not be subject to a test of legality. Rem remember now that not one Western country meets this very simple bar. Not one. There are always exceptions, and those exceptions means mean that you have the legal test. So I'm concerned. What, what, what about uh, like exceptions? For example, if you're in a in a cinema and you're um, you're shouting fire and you got to stand. That's a on. beautiful example. Let's talk a bit about that. That was uh, uttered by a judge named I forget his name. Owen Wilson. Paul, Paul, no, no, that's an actor. Doesn't well, doesn't matter what the guy's name was, but that this was this was state ah Ancilla. hi um, sorry hey. carry on all right so we were just talking about should it be legal to shout fire in a crowded theater and that that's that's <laughs> as in on on freedom of speech so that particular example is a great example because the judge stating that opinion in a uh, court case, in a freedom of speech court case from uh, the, from World War One, retracted his own statement later and said that this was a horrible example. I absolutely disapprove of how it has been abused to advocate censorship, and the court case itself was overturned as well, 40 years later. So, should it be legal to shout fire in a crowded theatre? Yes, absolutely. Should you be allowed? to cause harm to others, what knowingly cause harm to others. Now that's a separate issue. Yeah, could you repeat that? Because you were breaking up at the end. Oh, OK. Separate, separate, separate issue, and then? Fair enough. So I was saying that, should you be allowed to, to utter any opinion? Absolutely, as in, I'm sitting in this theater, and well, I, I think there's a fire up ahead. Should you, however, inciting panic, and knowingly causing harm to other people. If that is your motive rather than stating an opinion, that is that is a different thing entirely. And it's important to keep these these things in mind here, that they're actually different concepts. All right, interesting. What's your take on that, Ancilla? Um, I'm sort of jumping in in the middle of the conversation here, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, we're talking I about freedom of speech. And whether, on, but we're, talk, we're talking about freedom of speech and whether there should be any limitations on that or whether people should, um, and, and whether it depends on the intent, um, whether someone is just stating his opinion or trying to harm someone. Maybe you can give your opinion on, on the events with uh, in Paris this week and, and, uh, and uh, how do you see that playing out for uh, civil liberties for, for Europeans? Um, I have thought about that a lot, um, especially what Rick is saying. Um, we're having this whole debate about freedom of speech, which I think in the age of prosecution of a journalist is uh, hilarious unto itself. But um, um, in 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 the um, in a society where we think we should be able to say everything. Should we say everything, like just just to hurt people um, or to provoke people? Is that is that smart? Should we condone that? Um, should we make it illegal, or should we um, should we hold up freedom of speech as 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 the ultimate uh, goal? Um, and I think it's very difficult, especially. Um, obviously, I'm very for freedom of speech, freedom of information, freedom of press, all these things. But I do think that freedom of um, speech is probably aimed at a higher goal <laughs> rather than just insulting, the having the right to insult people. I guess insulting people is a different thing than um, whether people feel insulted. Um, and I think there's a distinction between the two. So um, um, there's my thought on that, but it's a thought process and it's still going on. That being said, I mean, I just find it completely bizarre what's going on right now in the world with uh, with Charlie Hebdo and um, that there's so many people who are um, are willing to protest on the streets of, of well, different cities across the world, I guess, uh, while, you know, journalists are getting... This is about a cartoon and, like, there's lots of uh, you know, Geert Wilders, our own Geert Wilders has tried to ban cartoons that were, uh, in his view, anti-Semitic. And nobody was like, nobody was uh, worried about that at the time. So it's quite bizarre that now all of a sudden it's like hyped up to be this really important thing. Well, as in other cases, people seem to just not, not care. You're making a couple of great yeah, this points. is definitely double standards. You're, you're making a couple of great points here, and so I'm I'm think I, I particularly want to highlight how you're you're highlighting the difference between whether something, whether a piece of speech or uh, uttering an opinion is morally okay and whether it's legally okay, and what a huge difference that is. Difference that is. A lot of people like to conflate these two, as in saying that no, I don't think it should be illegal to utter this horrible opinion. And a lot of people will strike at me saying that. What? So you think it's okay to to enrage all of this, all of these people? And uh, I, I I have to explain that. No, I don't think it's okay to be an asshole. I think it's I think you can be morally repulsive without a without a necessity for armed police to come and arrest you. There's there's a there's one line where you're not being nice to other people but the line where a nation state should bring out armed police to be prepared to use deadly force against you is a, is a line that's much much further out in the sand and it's important to not conflate these two and when people do point it out I think in the um, in the days after the Charlie Hebdo event some people have had a, a, a visit from authorities after uh, tweeting some things Right, um, which it's, is just it's bizarre, mind mind blowing. Um, I mean, not illegal things, not not death threats or any any of that. Just you know, using their their right to freedom mm -hmm. of speech. Um, yep. So there's definitely a lot of a lot of stuff going on um, in that field right now. You know, all the more all the more reason to vote Pirate Party, obviously. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Lucida, you moved to Berlin uh, recently. Uh, has that to do with the de deterioration of, of civil liberties in, in Holland, or was it for some other reason? I definitely feel more of an atmosphere in, of, of freedom in, uh, in Berlin. 
Um, not that it's like the ultimate uh, free place. Uh, I guess uh, there are hardly any of those places left in Europe. But um, it's definitely a little bit more uh, liberal than both politically as uh, culturally uh, in Berlin rather than Amsterdam. I think in Amsterdam we still sort of uphold this view that we have of ourselves as this like liberal, open-minded place. And it's, it's. I've just seen a change over the past 10 years, 15 years, uh, to be something completely different. Um, and I don't feel like there's any benefits uh, left um, that a big city should should offer. Um, anonymity, uh, freedom, uh, freedom to express yourself, freedom to, uh, you know, go out and meet people even if it's two o'clock in the morning, stuff like that. And I, def I definitely think that there's more, um, I'd feel a little bit more at home in Berlin for that matter. Yeah, we, we spoke um, um, some time ago also on this show with Arjen Kampaus, a, a Dutch hacktivist that also moved to Berlin. Um, are you in touch with him? Absolutely. Um, I, I love Arjen Kampaus. He's a, he's a great guy. And um, I talk to him quite regularly. He's helping me move. And, uh, <laughs> That's great. And, uh, and we talk about this topic a lot. And... Um, um, uh, he's, he's, he's been a bit of an influence for me for the decision for me to, to move to Berlin. He, he, um, not only him, but a lot of other people who live in Holland who kind of see what's going on and see how society is changing for the worse and it's going really pretty rapidly. Um, mm. Are openly talking about about getting out, which is just a completely uh, sad and surreal thing in itself, but um, but people are, are are looking for a future elsewhere. Interesting. So now you, you say could be the time for the Pirate Party to to blossom then, right? Because of everything that's going on. And uh, um, do you see any um, um, any growth in, within the Pirate Party in Holland or Germany? Um, I I do feel that the interest is there very much. Um, what is still lacking is, I think, people who want to join the Pirate Party, make a difference, uh, put some actual time and effort in there. People just want like these pe perfect people or perfect party to vote for and like put all their trust in, um, which of course would be nice if we could offer that. Um, but we're just like a bunch of people, a small group of people worldwide who are trying to make a difference. We have a great program. Um, and we have some really great ideas that I think will bring us into uh, the next uh, 50 years. Um, um, but we need more people to, to make this happen who will join the party and actively make a difference instead of like sitting at home on the couch waiting for doing voting hang day. Doing hangouts. <laughs> <laughs> doing Google Hangouts. <laughs> but, Speaking but, uh, of which, how's Ecuador? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't, I've not, I've not seen any pirates here, but uh, there are some interesting things going on here. But let's not let's not talk about Ecuador because then we need another three, uh, another two hours. So. But but um, if if we um, if we talk about how to grow a certain um, organization, then of course your book comes in handy um, because I, I read it swarm wise. I just loved it. Um, can you uh, tell me a bit more about your book and, and also maybe Swarm Ops, this new platform you have, and how that could propel growth for uh, for pirate parties across the world? Right. So Swarmwise, essentially, what it does is that it observes that in the past you ha you needed to maybe hire a hundred people full time to 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 accomplish something. So you got forty thousand work hours per week out of this workforce, but that is a hundred people times forty, right? No, that's 4,000. So you got 4,000 <laughs> work hours out of, out of this workforce per, per week. But you also needed to pay 100, 100 wages, right? What we can do today with the internet is that we can scale and swarm this effort out and push it out to the edges in a much more efficient manner. So you can recruit 2,000 volunteers 
who will contribute to two hours per week and you'll still get the same effort you'll still get your 4,000 hours put into this collaborative effort but you get two additional wins first your volunteers will be much more passionate than your employees ever were and second you don't have to pay them so everybody wins and the movement as such becomes much more decentralized much more agile and much more scalable than any movement before it and Swarmwise is about this kind of leadership by inspiring because you cannot you need to work with volunteers in a, in a different manner entirely than uh, if, if you're just bringing somebody in on the clock for a paycheck you need to lead by inspiring you need to lead by doing and Swarmwise is about that and Swarmhops is essentially the uh, software counterpart to that book I mean we have if you're looking at open source and uh, free software that movement has had 40 years to develop its tools to to collaborate if you're looking at civic software however if you're looking at civic movements if you're looking at policy making movements those tools do not exist that decentralized collaboration does not really exist so swarm ops is kind of one stab in the ground if you like to just to organize people it's it's in alpha and you can find it at uh, the, well, the easiest way would probably be to go to dev.swarmops.com and try out the sandbox dev.swarmops.com so that's a work in progress essentially so and are the pirate parties uh, going to use that software the Swedish Pirate Party has been using for a while, so has the Finnish. There are other Pirate Parties interested in using it, and we'll see how adoption catches up. I'm, I'm a bit cautious about overselling it while it's still in alpha and features are being added, but it's certainly baseline usable at this point. Perfect. Interesting. Well, we, we already um, uh, for more than 40 minutes in this Hangout. Any closing uh, thoughts, uh, either from you and Silla or from you, uh, Rick? on Bitcoin or, or privacy or freedom of speech. Well, privacy is maybe not a, we're using Google, uh, a Google product, and so I'm sorry for all the privacy. <laughs> out there. Right. I was right. discussing I'm, with I'm, Rick, as, as soon as we have a better version, like an open source version of Google Hangout on air, we'll, we'll use it, of course. But. Yeah. I guess uh, Mega is working on a, a chat application that's encrypted and stuff, right? Yeah, so I'm right. really interested in seeing how that works out. I, I would love for something that, like that to be there. Yeah, encryption is not the issue. Usability is the issue. Everybody ha is doing good encryption, or every there are a lot of tech people doing good encryption. The problem is tech people generally can't do usability, and so you need you need the two to converge. But I've been talking a lot about the uh, long term long term developments of the blockchain ledger in this hangout, and so 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 why don't we end with your thoughts on that? Where's the blockchain heading? Um. Uh. uh I guess we have no idea, which is really interesting. Um, mm. I'm talking to some people in Berlin um, who work at Ethereum, uh, which is really interesting. And um, I had a hard time grasping like what what the possibilities are of this technique, and if they are used, if if that's always going to be uh, for the good of the people, so to say. And uh, what really sparked my interest was when somebody said, um, we can um, um, blockchain uh, history in a way that can't be, um, can't be altered after the fact. And that really sparked my interest, because I definitely think that there's a couple of things in history that might not always be represented in the way that it actually happened at the time. Um, I think there's like this great saying that says the winner writes up history and if somebody else had won, you know, it would have been uh, written up completely different. Hmm. Um, so that's where it really sparked my interest, like how to use this technique for something of a greater good and uh, I re I'm really hopeful that it, that it can and it will. Well, those are beautiful words to um, to end this um, hangout with. So, thank thanks, guys. So, um, maybe briefly, where can people find you, Rick? Uh, thank you, Sil. Thank you, Paul. I'm uh, I have a blog at falkvinge.net. That's f-a-l-k-v-i-n-g-e.net, and there's contact details right there. 
Perfect. And Ancilla, where can people find you? Twitter. I'm always on Twitter. Hit me up. I thought you had a Twitter break for a few days. I did, but I'm back and rocking it. <laughs> I had my first uh, fight right as I got back today, so, uh, you know, there's oh, uh, lots of interesting stuff going on on Twitter. It's, it's usually the other way around, you know. Twitter makes you have makes you want to have drinks with people you've never met, and Facebook makes you want to throw drinks at people you, you consider your friends. <laughs> that is exactly. very true. Yep. True. <laughs> right. Well, thanks, guys, and let's do it again uh, in a or so. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Ansel. Thank you, Paul. Okay, Good to see you guys. again. Bye. Cheers.